New York City. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and skip my first slide. Uh, wow, it's my first time in Budapest and I'm really looking forward to exploring the city some more. And this is a pretty amazing space, so thanks for having me here. Um, so what I want to talk tonight, what I want to talk about tonight is, is ECMAScript 6, you know, the next version of JavaScript, which is coming to browsers right now. And you can also use it with these things called transpilers, where they transpile this new ECMAScript 6 code into the normal you know, code that your older browsers will run. And this is more or less finalized by now. The, the specification draft is got all the important features, and most of what's left to do is just editorial tweaks uh, to make things clearer, have less typos. And what I want to talk about in particular is you know, the, the, the awesome parts, right? Because it's easy to pick some syntax sugar enhancements, you know, class syntax or so on, and, and talk about those. And there's some good talks about that, some great talks about that. Um, you know, some great talks about the good parts of ECMAScript 6, but I want to highlight just a couple of the awesome parts in the time we have here. So, you know, that's me. Um, things I've been doing recently are working on the web platform, essentially, making it better for developers. Um, and to kind of set the stage for, for ECMAScript 6, the awesome parts, I want to ask, you know, why, why do we have this new version? Why are we evolving on the JOT language that's more or less, you know, with small tweaks, stayed static for much of, you know, my development career, at least? Well, the best argument I've seen comes from this guy named Brendan Eich, who you might know as the inventor of JavaScript. Um, but the place that he gave this argument is, is pretty funny. It's Hacker News comment threads. So the CTO of Mozilla spends a lot of his time arguing on Hacker News with random people, uh, which is great because you get really fun and, and good exchanges where he makes kind of profound points like this, saying that you know, if the web stagnates, we get into the situation that we're in with IE6 or Android 2.x, and developers get unhappy and they start turning to other development paradigms, you know, whether they be as innocuous as CoffeeScript or something perhaps pushed by a larger organization with a different agenda, something like Silverlight, you know, that used to be called WPF Everywhere, Microsoft's way of putting their solution in the browser, or, or something like Dart or, or Knackle from Google. Right? And, and people will start using these, you know, despite the fact that they're not open, that they're proprietary, that they're one platform only, because they can allow you to move faster than this stagnated language, essentially from 1998. And this isn't acceptable. We need to evolve. We need to take advantage of what we've built, which is beautiful, and not start over on some new platform. We can't throw away all that code and all that developer brain power just because we're not willing to evolve the language and learn new things. Okay, so that's good. That's why we need a new version of JavaScript. But you might still be suspicious. Why do we need JavaScript at all? Why can't we do like bytecode for the web and then that'll be awesome and, and you can write whatever language you want? Well, Alex Russell, another, another member of the committee that designs JavaScript, makes one argument on his blog that I think is really powerful which is essentially this is just how the world is, right? It's the one language that every vendor is going to ship, no matter what. Google's gonna ship Dart, and Microsoft's gonna ship VBScript, but everybody's gonna ship JavaScript. So if we can evolve JavaScript, then that really improves the web platform that we're all writing on much more than anything else. All right, finally, why should you care, right? So you, I, I've hopefully convinced you that these things are, are interesting, and. But why are they useful? Well, uh, I think the funnest argument is to think about just your learning experience, right? Because as a programmer, you don't often get entirely new tools in your toolbox, right? You, you can learn something like Haskell or Lisp, but what are you going to build with Haskell or Lisp? That's, that's going to be a, a paradigm changing you know, thing in your brain, and then you're going to go back to writing web UIs in your day job. So if you get an evolved language like ECMAScript 6, you'll get to really appreciate uh, these new kind of paradigms and things that are brought to the table without sacrificing actual ability to build real things. So that said, what are the awesome parts that I want to focus on today? Well, there's two. 
Um, first is generators, and the second is something called template strings. And generators have gotten a lot of press, um, especially in Node, uh, for some of the things they enable around async programming. But I actually want to talk about them as a case for lazy iteration uh, and how that will enable us to be much more efficient with our data processing and much more idiomatic. Um, template strings are, are much less known, and they're, you know, when you, when you first hear about them, they essentially seem like they might do just what their name does. They're just a way of, you know, string interpolation. But they're actually much more powerful and will enable some pretty neat things that we're going to cover in some detail. So what about generators? Well, to give an intro to the concept, right, here's a, a synchronous function that returns the sequence 0, 1, 2. And you call it and you get back an array which is eagerly computed, right? They computed the whole array, allocated that entire block of memory ahead of time. And then when you loop over it using this new for of syntax, it's just going to loop over the array, which is pre-allocated. So the for of syntax is not that mysterious. It's essentially just what you always wished for loops would do in the first place. Um, so uh, what I want to just stress here is the eagerly allocated nature of our array return value. So the, the, what you can do with generators is you can have these new types of functions, denoted function star, okay? And inside that, you get a new keyword called yield, which allows you to yield values one at a time into the return value, which is an iterator. You know, array is a type of iterator, but a generator returned from a generator function is also a type of iterator. So you can loop over these generators with for of, just like you could with arrays. But what's different here is that the sequence is lazily computed. So it, it's not that you get back a block containing 0, 1, 2 pre-allocated. It's that you get back a sequence of instructions for saying, when I go to the next element in the list, go back into the function and figure out what it's going to yield next. So this is kind of cool, maybe. Um, but let's, let's dissect this to figure out what we can build before we, we decide like how awesome is this for sure. You know, how fundamentally new is this capability? What does it bring to the table? So to understand what's really going on here, let's stop relying on for of as our, as our crutch, right? So we have the same function, and we call it, and we get this generator object, and we manually iterate on it. So by, that means we call the next value, or the, the next method on it, which gives us back this sequence of objects. Okay, so it says value zero, done, false, value one, done, false, so on, until it gets to the end, when there's no value, but it is done. So what's interesting here is that for of essentially just boils down to calling next and sugar for, for this type of operation. Um, but what you want to notice is that each call to next somehow seems to execute some of the code inside the function in order to get the next yielded value. And that can be made pretty explicit uh, with something more powerful. So here's a way of using generators to yield up the Fibonacci sequence one at a time. Right? So the Fibonacci sequence is essentially the sequence down at the bottom, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, so on. What we do is we have an infinite loop, right, which will continue running forever, except at the bottom of each one, it yields the current value in the sequence. And so yielding will take you out of the function. Right? You call next, and it goes up to the point where you yield. And then it says, OK, I'm done. Suspend the function. Don't run any more code. Don't go back to the top of the while loop, right? Instead, you're going to want to just log that value. Now we do the next iteration of our for of loop. We call next the second time, and it goes back to the, it resumes. It goes to the top of the while loop, does, oh, okay, let me do that. And so eventually, you can print values one by one as you pull them by executing code inside the function each time. So this ability to jump in and out of the function is really kind of impressive and powerful. Um, and that's what really Node.js programs end up using it for, is the ability to pause execution until an asynchronous result comes back. But let's, let's explore this infinite sequence idea some more. So here I've created a generator function, which is, you know, it operates on iterables, like, like generators, like the things returned by other generator functions. And what it does is it Gives, you can give it any lazy sequence, any, any iterable, and it'll loop through it, and if it gets to a certain counter, then it'll stop. It'll say, okay, I'm done, 
return, because return still has the same meaning, get me out of here forever. Otherwise, it'll yield, which is the temporary suspension and yielding of the value. So if we do this, where we take the first five elements of the Fibonacci sequence, then even though the Fibonacci sequence is an infinite sequence, we only get the first five elements. So this really emphasizes how lazy that computation really was. So it never bothers computing the rest of the Fibonacci sequence, right? Which you know is a good thing because it's infinite and you don't want to crash your computer. But uh, it actually just takes the first five. So you can generalize this, right? You can write lazy versions of everything, everything on a radar prototype, all those fun underscore JS methods. So in this example, right, it's more, more practical. You can have a lazy list of DOM elements or an eager list even, and then you can filter them and then you can map them to their text and then you can do a reduce operation, which is not lazy, you're just saying consume the entire thing and give me back the, the entire text concatenated. So in this example, because filter and map return generators, nothing actually happens until we call the reduce. They return the generators, which contain instructions for performing these operations, but they don't actually do any operations themselves. So once you get to the reduce, it's all done in a single pass through the list, and this is the key. You get the benefits of this kind of declarative step-by-step -step functional data manipulation where you say first filter, then map, then reduce. But if you were to do this with arrays, right, if you were to use array.prototype.filter and map and reduce, you would actually be doing three loops through the array, which is pretty inefficient. And I still do it in my code all the time because it's nice and clear. But if I were ever to worry about performance of that code, I'd be in trouble. And so generators give you the best of both worlds. So I think this is pretty awesome. Um, all right, so you know, going back to some of the stuff I was saying earlier, just to give you a taste, even if it's not the focus, the idea that you can suspend execution until someone calls next is pretty amazing because you could use this, for example, for async operations, right? So you could wait until an async operation comes back and then resume execution of the function. And this is kind of inside out, and it's a little tricky how it works, but we'll see it on the next slide and, and just give you an idea. Moreover, like more, more importantly than how exactly this works uh, is just kind of what this represents in terms of the Node community. Because to me, you know, I see all these conservative Node.js people, you know, whether they be community leaders or not, who are like, no, I don't need a new language, I'm happy with Node, I don't need a new module system, Node's perfect. And, and they're so scared by change, they're so scared, they don't really take to heart these arguments that I make for you know, learning a new language, evolving the web, evolving the platform. But the moment that the community got their hands on generators, they're in V8, they're in the new versions of Node, there was just this huge wave of enthusiasm. Tons of people were interested in playing with them, building entire frameworks like Koa, building tons of, uh, it, everybody was so excited. So to me, the fact that when you find something that's actually useful in the real world, you know, whether it be asynchronous function execution or lazy sequences or anything, uh, the community will actually respond. To me, this shows that ES6 is gonna be appreciated pretty far and wide. All right, so to go back to that example, right? So the idea is when you get to this yield, we're gonna be able to pause the function execution until the data gets loaded. So that's an asynchronous function call that returns, for example, a promise. And you do a yield and it pauses until the promise is fulfilled. Or if the promise is rejected, then it will actually cause the yield to throw an error. And that'll be caught by the catch block. And in either case, the finally will get executed. So it's just like the synchronous programming constructs that we've always wanted. You can use things like try, catch, and finally, let errors bubble until they hit the nearest catch. You can even use them inside loops, which if you ever try to do that with a callback is pretty nightmarish. Uh, it's all the other power of these generators to suspend your execution. And so the magic here is in the spawn function, which I'm not gonna discuss, but it turns the yield statements. It says, oh, when I get paused, I need to do something special to go off and do this async computation. So it uses the fact that the language allows you to pause execution of a function to then go off and use that for asynchronous computation. So that is also pretty awesome. All right, so where can you use these things? Well, you can use this in a transpiler called Tracer. 
which is the, the kind of canonical ES6 transpiler. You feed it ECMAScript 6 code containing almost any feature, and it will give you back ES5 code that allows you to use it in most browsers. Um, Continuum, I think, is a fun playground. It's a little old by now, but it's essentially an implementation of ECMAScript 6 in ECMAScript 3. It's a virtual machine. I don't think it will really be performant enough to run your code, but if you want to get a full flavor for what's going on behind the scenes of an ECMAScript 6 virtual machine, check it out. So it's in Chrome, and it's in Firefox, and I think that asterisk is actually no longer accurate as of a week ago. Firefox and Chrome both have fully compliant versions of the generators. Um, and it's also in Node, uh, in you know, any of the newest 11, 0 0.11 versions. And 0 0.12 should be coming out soon, hopefully. I think that we've heard that for several months now. But once it does, we'll have a stable version of Node in which you can use these generators. Um, finally, there's a, there's a thing I don't mention here called Regenerator, which is from Facebook. It's another transpiler, but it's focused entirely on generators. And it produces some really nice, clean, readable code, which I think is a big plus if you're trying to debug the output. Uh, but it's, it's nice and focused, and a lot of effort went into that, so I want to give a shout out to that. So on the transpiler solution, though, let me just give one more, one more thing. There's this tool called ES6ify, which uses Tracer to transpile your code, and then use source maps and browserify, so you can essentially write these modules, you know, these Node.js style modules that work in the browser, but are using ES6 features. Like here we use a bunch of stuff. We use for of, we use let, we have a generator functions yielding, and we have a yield star, which I didn't even talk about. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. And you can see it's all broken down into this, this source mapped series of files on the, on the left. And you can even step through in the debugger and your call stack you know, is full of kind of weird things that weren't written by you, you know, the $g dot inner function. But it's still pretty neat and allows you to debug ES6 code with source maps. So that's ES6ify. All right. So generators, pretty cool. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Template strings. All right, the, the little known, most awesome part of ES6, in my opinion. So the basic template string looks something like this. So uh, you get the ability to you know, put uh, variables interpolated inside your strings as long as you use backticks. And you even get multi-line strings, which by itself is probably going to be a really big deal for a lot of my code. Um, so that's kind of cool, but I mean, I think it's only useful. It's, it doesn't qualify as awesome, so why am I talking about it? Well, where it gets awesome is this next feature, which is pretty hard to dig into, so let's, let's take a minute. So if you put an identifier before the first backtick, then it translates, essentially, behind the scenes into a function call with these special forms of, uh, yeah, of, of arguments, right? So you, you split up the string into segments. You say, here's the pieces of the string that are the raw versions, right, with all the escape sequences maintained. Um, and, and then let's put the variables in as positional arguments after that. And don't worry about the raw versus cook thing too much, but you can kind of see the difference. So this is kind of weird. Um, is, it, is it awesome? Why would this qualify as awesome? It's just like a really weird way to make a function call. Well, it's, it's awesome because of what we can build with it. So if you're given this kind of data, you're given what the strings are at each position and what the values of the variables are at each position, then you can start doing some really interesting things. So the, the most canonical example is something called contextual auto-escaping. And contextual auto-escaping is best motivated with an example like this. Like, let's say we're just doing a query selector all on our, on our DOM. And we often just concatenate, you know, dot plus class name. Well, what if class name itself contains a dot? And this isn't too far-fetched. You might be writing a WYSIWYG HTML editor that allows people who don't know all the rules of CSS classes to type in there any, any class name. Well, if, if it contains a dot, you're going to be in trouble because it's going to translate it actually into two class selectors in a row. Well, what if we built a function called QSA 
that we could pass a template string in this kind of special syntax that we just saw. And it gets past these arguments. It gets, you know, raw, the dot, and then there's nothing after. And then the parameter there is a class name. So we can write this QSA function. So it says, oh, the first value I'm being passed in the strings ends in a dot. So the first variable I'm being passed needs to be escaped like a CSS class. And you can have similar rules. If it ends with a hash, it needs to be escaped like an ID. If you're inside an attribute selector, then you need to be escaped like an attribute. You can do all these types of things to do the kind of contextual auto-escaping that allows you to safely pass in any string for class name. And this generalizes pretty far, right? So let's say we wrote a function called safeHTML that allowed you to pass in any string with substitutions at any point in it, and it would know exactly what it would do. So, you know, we have many different things that you have to do in this initial situation, but with a sufficiently smart parser, you can do all of them. You can say, you know, filter the URLs, make sure there's no end quotes. You can do query string escaping at the query string. You can do script escaping in the onclick attribute. You can make sure there's no unsafe CSS. And of course, you can do just simple HTML encoding. And you always have the context because you're always past the appropriate amount of stuff to be able to determine where you are in the tree. So we can actually do this. We can write this function. And you'll end up with output like this, where we've done you know, nothing to the, to the URL. We've done query string encoding. We've done HTML encoding. We've gotten rid of the attempt to hijack our CSS with an expression. It works out great. And there's actually a link down here where some people at Google have put together, I think they're at Google, they're at least focused on Google code, and I'm pretty sure only Google employees use Google code. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty impressive, like they have some papers and so on where they explain the, the theory behind their parser that they built, their safe HTML function. So you can do exactly this. So by itself, that's pretty amazing. But you can imagine more uses for, for template strings, right? So even something as simple as localization, you know, this is always just pretty annoying. You don't really have a standardized template for these, these template for localization strings. But you know, what if you want to just do something like this, where you use these little signifiers after your substitution to say, ah, it should be used the number formatter, or this should use the currency formatter, something like that. You know, this is just something I came up with, but you can imagine something a much more powerful kind of domain-specific language for, for localization. Um, and, and this is one of my favorite examples, right? Because it's a real pain when you end up in this situation. You're using the, the nice, pretty, regular expression syntax that we have built into our language, you know, with the, with the slashes. But then, you know, your boss comes and says, oh, well, actually, we need to work with more than just commas for separators. What if they use a space or uh, anything else, right? So now you have to switch to the regex constructor. That means you have to switch to strings, which don't handle backslashes all that well. And you have to use plus signs, and you just are sad. So instead of that, you could write a really cool uh, template string uh, handler that takes this raw template string and allows you to use interpolation for the variables. And in this case, it'll use the raw uh, version that gets passed to it instead of the cooked one. And it'll say, oh, well, I see a slash D. Let me just pass that through to the regex constructor as slash slash D in the string, things like that. So it's, it's pretty much perfect for regular expression construction. It's much better than this annoying regex constructor. Um, OK, and then another good example. So you know, so a while ago, Facebook announced this, this language, um, this framework called React, which is pretty cool. And as part of it, they had this less cool thing, which is a language called JSX, which is essentially JavaScript with a bunch of HTML mashed into the middle of it because they thought we needed another to compile to JS language, and what was missing from JS was HTML. So instead, uh, you could just use the standard uh, JavaScript language of ES6 with a template string, which takes these variable, that takes these, these interpolated you know, backtick strings and just translates it like a compile to JS language would, but does it in terms of the semantics of the language to this React model. So you don't need to compile the dish language. You can just use ECMAScript 6. All right, um, last example. And this one's just kind of far out there. And I don't know if it's actually a good idea, but it's pretty fun. Is uh, you can use it as a, as a domain-specific language for doing anything, right? 
So in this example, you could use it to, you could use an sh function, which takes in these arguments and like parses out, oh hey, well let me, you don't, I don't have to return a string, why don't I return a child process object representing the child process that's been spawned in my Node.js application? Or if you're on the browser, you could write a post function, right, which takes its arguments and uses kind of the HTTP format, the raw HTTP format almost, that gets sent down the wire and parses that into a call to XML HP request and says, here's the URL. Oh, and hey, I'll do the encoding for you. Don't worry about it if you pass in some query string stuff for A and B. And then, you know, oh, here's my header. Just let me set my header. And here's my body. So let me JSON code foo and bar. So I think that's pretty neat. So in, in total, with template strings, you end up solving basically everything in the language, um, to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, you, so you get the basics, right? You get string interpolation and, and basic templating but, and multi-line strings, but you also get this contextual auto-escaping idea, which is a very generic way of protecting you against XSS and Jackson attacks. You get localization formatting, dynamic regular expressions, embedded HTML, and all these DSLs that we just showed. So I think that deserves the awesome badge. All right, so where can you use this? Well, basically only with transpilers. Browsers have not prioritized implementing this yet, although I have heard rumors that maybe that's next on some people's lists, but I don't really want to promise anything because yeah, they didn't promise me anything. So, but the transpilers work really well. Even if you just use them for template strings, you'll get a lot out of them. So definitely check out Tracer um, and Continuum if you really just want to play with it in an abstract environment. Okay. So that's it. Those are the two, I think, awesome features of ECMAScript 6 that I really wanted to put in front of you. Um, so, you know, just to conclude, some words, you know, the future of JavaScript is important. It's important to me, and, and I think it should be important to you. You can learn more about all the other man, like, cool features in ECMAScript 6. You can either read the spec draft, which is totally cool if you're up for that, but it is written in a strange language called ECMAScript, which is kind of like a programming language but not really, uh, uh, anyway. Um, I had to write some of it myself for the promises work and it was a learning experience. Um, if you want a more accessible introduction, an, an older presentation I gave that was more of a run through all the features is at es6isni.com. Uh, and you can also go to the, the original source, which is the wiki where they have these proposals. And the wiki is often kind of outdated compared to the actual spec draft. So be careful, but usually there's a big marker at the top saying this is outdated. So if you wander into one of those areas, just, you know, okay, don't, don't go there. Um, more, more practically, if you want to get involved with or at least follow the discussions that are taking place around the next version of JavaScript, uh, you can follow the Twitter account ESDiscuss, which I run. So ESDiscuss is a mailing list, ESDiscuss at Mozilla.org, which is where the committee and the community talk about features for the next version of JavaScript or the one after that, or even the current one, you know, things like that. And so the Twitter account comes from saying, what if not everybody has time to read all these crazy esoteric mailing list posts, and instead I posted a 140 character summary of each thread with links that people could click to see the full post. So that's a, a pretty good time investment in my opinion. ESDiscuss.org is also something put together by a friend uh, which is a much nicer format for reading the mailing list. So if you've ever seen those mailing list interfaces for any of the standards bodies, they're horrible, horrible. You never want to read one of those if you don't have to. Um, but this guy put it together a website that aggregates them into nice format, puts them in markdown, everything's, everything's beautiful. So that's a much more, much more fun way to jump into the biggest discuss mailing list. Um, for things you can do, in the, in the world, right? You can just be adventurous and use a transpiler, use ES6 features in your next app. Even if you have to support you know, IE9 or IE8, or maybe even lower, you can still transpile these features to, and use them in, in the browsers of today. So overall, just, just don't stagnate. That's what I really encourage you to do. Keep up to date on this stuff, stay interested, use it. It's cool stuff. Thank you. Uh, questions? Blown away by presentation. 
Works for me. <laughs> oh, go. Okay, what's up? Yeah. Um, the question was, what, what do I personally have to do with ECMAScript? Um, uh, yeah, it's a little complicated. I don't work for them. Um, nobody actually works for, for ECMA, or, okay, nobody who's working on JavaScript works for ECMA, uh, the, the standards body, which used to stand for European Computer Manufacturers Association, but now it just stands for ECMA. Um, anyway, uh, it's a bunch of representatives from companies, mostly implementers, like Google and Mozilla and Microsoft, but also some universities who are interested, and just people like uh, like PayPal employs Douglas Crockford, so they they send him as a representative, um, and Facebook just sends a number of people because they're interested in the future of the language. Uh, and, and they get together at face-to-face -face meetings, and they're the ultimate decision makers, you know, on, on the standard. I just got involved via the mailing list, you know, I, I just visited this, this mailing list one day, and for some reason I thought it would be really cool. I think I'm pretty much a big nerd, but uh, I did, and, and I subscribed. And you know, I, I run the Twitter account, which I just came up with like two years ago. Um, I was sitting at LXJS, and I was like, oh, this would be a really good idea. And so that's, that's kind of taken off. Um, and most recently, I've gotten involved because I've, I've been like the promise guy in, in the world, right? And I did Promises A+, that community-driven specification, which was adopted by a lot of Promise libraries in the community. And there came a time when we were thinking about putting Promises in the platform. And at first the thought was to put it in the DOM. But I was able to attend a TC39 meeting, a committee meeting, uh, you know, only a couple hours drive from where I live in New York. Uh, and I was able to show them the Promise proposal, Promises spec text that I put together, and they actually thought it was, it was probably good enough to incorporate into ECMAScript 6, not just the DOM. So at this point, I guess I, I'm pretty involved because I'm writing spec text for ECMAScript 6. Um, but it's still not in any official capacity. I'm not employed by an ECMA member. I'm not on the committee. Um, I can't block consensus if, if that happens. You know, usually everybody's pretty agreeable. but. Ultimately, I guess that's what decides if you're in ECMAScript, uh, in TC39, is whether you can say no. Um, so that, I think that's, that's pretty much the answer to the question. Do, you, yeah. do we really need promises along with the yield stuff and generators? Yeah, so the question was, do we really need promises along with the yield stuff and generators? And the answer is yes, because you need something to yield, right? So yield takes a right-hand side and if your function just returns undefined and you yield undefined, then the, the, there's no way for the runtime to know it needs to wait until this is done because undefined is already done. Um, so if you, have, if you return a promise from your function and then you yield on the promise, then you can have this little wrapper, the spawn that I showed, say, oh, when the promise is fulfilled, then resume, or if it's rejected, then throw. So that's the idea. They work really well together. And there's been some alternative ideas in the community where they have like functions that return functions which call you back with a different argument. But there was a really good presentation at, uh, at JSConf EU that kind of deconstructed each of those solutions uh, and showed that they were kind of weird in terms of if you did something slightly different than the normal pattern, they wouldn't behave like you would expect. And it's largely because without an object like a promise, that actually has these semantics, you, you, you can't really capture what you want to capture, the idea that you have to react to state changes in that way. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, the question was, did they get promises right in the spec? You know, there were lots of problems with different implementations, for example, the jQuery promises. Um, and yes, they did, largely because I, I made it so. Um, no, honestly, like, uh, there, I think the, the discussion we did in Promises A Plus was actually a great example of how standards should work these days, you know, where, where the community comes up with something and says, this is the pattern, we've pretty much got this, and then it's the standards body's job to say, okay, well, let's just make sure that's completely formalized and you've thought of all the edge cases and everything, 
but we're more or less going to do what you did. So you know, there, there's a lot of discussion about like, should we have monads in our promises? But that got shut down pretty quickly, and we're just sticking with normal promises, a plus like promises, um, and and certainly not jQuery promises. So pretty happy about how it turned out. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. I see. <laughs> and, uh...